Hey guys, welcome to I Shoot Watches. Today I'm going to talk about this Swatch prototype that I bought. And um, this really is a Swatch prototype. It's a prototype for the model YAS100G, which is also called Body and Soul. And it's a, it's, it's an irony, which means metal case. Um, it's a skeletonized ETA 2841 movement. And um, you can see that this is an actual prototype because it has no uh, stamping or engraving on the back of it. And um, I only paid a couple hundred francs for this, 220, I think. Oh, so let me do this. This is the... This is the watch, like the release version of the watch. So it's a skeleton movement, which means you can see everything inside it. And it has a clear case back, so you can see the back also, which is cool. You can see the rotor on the on the release version of it says swatch on it. And again, because this is a prototype, it doesn't say anything on it. Um, and then I have a movement here that I'll compare this to so you can see what parts of it have been skeletonized. Um, so these, I, I feel really lucky, like the, the price of this is 185, or that was the price, I'm not sure if it's still available. Um, and 2841, I have a 2842 here to compare to, and I think that this might actually be a 2842, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, on eBay, they're selling for a couple hundred. And this, this is some, I don't know why that's, that doesn't make sense, 400 and something. But, uh, and then this is the one I bought, 211 francs. For the prototype so that's one of the cool things about living in switzerland is you can get something like this for the retail price of a of a regular watch and for me i just think it's so much more interesting to, to have a prototype both because they're unique um but also with this one i didn't realize it but it, uh after i received it i didn't realize it from the listing but after i received it i realized that the movement has been skeletonized so it's it's not just a skeleton movement it was actually skeletonized like all of the cutouts in the movement because it's a prototype were cut out by cnc machining out of a regular 2842 movement so i'll show you that actually let me show you that now so what a skeleton movement um well, let me, just before I use the microscope, see that this is a 2842 and it has a hole here already uh, where for this watch, it, they've also put a hole in the dial so you can see the, the balance wheel moving. Um, but this is a non-skeletonized movement underneath, but it does have this hole in it. Now on, the, on my prototype here, there's a, they've opened that whole area up massively so that the whole balance wheel is exposed. They've retained this portion here, which holds the jewel, um, but the, this is all opened up. And when you, when you look at that, I'll put it under the microscope in a second, but basically because the main plate is made out of brass, you can see the brass, you, I, they're made out of brass and then they're rhodium plated. So you can see how the CNC machining has revealed the brass underneath. And that's how I know that it's skeletonized after it's a, it's a regular movement that's been skeletonized by custom CNC machining as opposed to a skeleton movement. If you buy the actual, uh, and then here you can see the, the rhodium that's left over from this cutout that was in the original movement. Um, uh, of course, if you buy a new one of these, it's going to have a movement where all these plates were actually reworked and manufactured with the skeleton cutouts already in them. So you'll have you'll see 
if you buy a new YAS100G, you'll the insides of these will all be uh, rhodium plated because it was it was fabricated that way. So let's see if I can show some of that in detail here. You can see it really easily there. So, um, I don't want to take the dial off of this other one here, but you can see what's been skeletonized here. This this has been opened up around the, this gear. Um, the barrel itself has been opened up. Uh, the gears have been opened up. Uh, and then if we flip it over, we can do an actual side-by-side -side comparison. So on the back, the balance wheel is more exposed, of course, but it's you can see here it's even much much more opened up on this. Um, you can see the rotor itself has been opened up, and that again is you see the brass on the inside there. Um, let me try to get this weight to go the other way. So are we in the right position here? Yeah. So you can see the gears themselves have been opened up. The bottom of the barrel has been opened up. Um, I'm not sure if that gear actually has these holes in it or not. You can see that there's a hole has been made here, so you can see through there. Um, and then it's been opened up here and here. So a lot of... Uh, skeleton skeletonizing going on there and the fun thing about that is if you're learning watches you it it, 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 it can help you you know this is the in this area we have the keyless works when you pull the crown out you see how the keyless works works and you can study that and kind of so basically, when you wind the watch, this gear, this gear winds the gears in the back, which we can look at in a second. When you pull the when you pull the stem out, that gear is disengaged because it goes to a round part of the stem, and the square part of the stem catches a gear here that then does the, the setting. And so all that does is it this little gear you see through the hole there turns this gear, which is I think called the setting gear, and that in turn turns the hour hand wheel. And then the hour hand wheel is geared to the minute hand wheel. And uh, so those move, you know, they're geared together. Um, and then also they're, they're, they're sliding against the cannon pinion so like the cannon pinion is a friction fit thing. So when the when the um, when it's in regular mode, you can wind it without changing the time setting. And then when you pull it into setting mode, you're basically overdriving the power. You're, you're overriding the power that's going to the hands and you are forcing it to, to, to spin on the cannon pinion. And the cannon pinion is like a pressure fit thing, so it, it grabs it, but it's not grabbing it so hard that it can't be overridden by this. It's like a clutch in a way. So anyway, that's, um, oh, it's also fun to see the um, the balance wheel and um, escapement and everything working. And then on the back,
when we're, again, when we're in mind, winding mode, this gear is engaged right under here. So it's going to turn the, all these winding gears. And these are the same. You see the, the, the gear that the rotor turns is are these this little pair. So you can see all that winding stuff happening. Anyway, I think that's kind of cool way to to um, get used to thinking about how a, a base a standard watch movement works if you're learning. Sorry about that. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing about this is that. I think that this may have no lubrication on it because if I put this on the time grapher, it has a hard time even figuring out. Let's see if I can get that. You can't detect the, the beat on that. Um, So I've thought about, I, I, let me see if this thing works. Uh, it's not okay. Good. It could also be just because there's plastic. See, this one does, oh, let's see. 2160. Beat error nine milliseconds. That's probably true. So th this is a, t a twenty-eight forty-two. It's probably it's not wound actually. That's part of the problem. I just shook it a bit to get it going. So that's probably why it's not running great. But it's still the the time grapher is able to detect um, the beat rate and everything on this. And on this one, it can't detect it. So, like I said, I think it might be that it has no lubrication, or it also could have been in the process of um, skeletonizing it, it could have been damaged because it's really just a, a prototype showpiece. But I'm, I probably won't take this apart because I think it's kind of cool to keep it exactly as new uh, because it's a one of a kind piece it's probably better not to mess with it just keep it um so that's that the other thing i want to show is this cool thing i got at the thrift store in geneva and this is a thrift store out by rolex and patek philippe and i i was when i saw this i was like I didn't know what it was, but I was like, it says Zeiss on it, and it's some kind of a microscope. So I was like, it's missing some part. But I talked them into selling it to me for five francs, which is about five dollars. And then I came home and I Googled it, and it's really cool and really crazy. So the way it works is you put a pair of binoculars on it, and let me see if I can get this. So it has this little rubber strap. It's made for these Zeiss binoculars. Um, and there's a couple different, there's a few different magnifications you can use. But um, let me see. Uh, yeah, it's just really cool because it's, it's stereo. It's super portable. Um, this other YouTuber, JD Richard, just posted a video about um, his kit for traveling, and um, which is a really great video, like a watchmaking kit in a little um, Pelican case for traveling. And uh, I, I traveled with this to New York and met with uh, Watch With Mike, Mike from Watch With Mike, and we looked at some stuff. And I also made it so that you can pop a... 
Sony's uh, RX Zero uh, Mark II onto one of the eyepieces uh, and film through it. And you can kind of look through one and, and film through the other. And then I'm, I also made an integrated camera, which is not here right now, but you can put a, a camera underneath it um, that focuses on the watch. And the field of view is is pretty good. It's kind of perfect for watchmaking. Like you could definitely like use it to lubricate the balance jewel or just about anything. Um, anyway, I thought that was super cool. And then just because I haven't posted anything for a while, I also wanted to, I wanted to do a brief, Uh, I want to do a brief update on the GG so there's a there's a bunch of updates in the in the PDF and the, the, the way to find this now is go to the channel page I, I might change it again but basically I've kind of hidden it on the channel page you have to go to the image of the GG watch and there's a link to the playlist for the videos about this and also to the PDF I might make it more I mean I'm the, right now the playlist is all um, unlisted so it no longer shows up in my regular feed but that, that's because I was experimenting with, um, I was worried that people were getting sick of hearing about this watch. And also um, just kind of, I'm, I'm debating if I'm going to make a single video that covers all of this. And so I don't want to have those other videos around anymore, but I don't think I'll do that. I mean, I will do it eventually, but if it, anyway, <laughs> like too much. Um, uh, internal monologue going on here um okay so what did i want to say oh so there are these news there's this thing in the last update i i found these the the person who said that he made the watch or had it made for him which is kind of critical um because i'm not even sure yeah he did say he had it made for him but basically there's a whole way through this story where it's, it's really more about keeping secrets than telling the truth. And like, I'm not sure who's telling the truth and who's not. Now, the other thing I want to say is that, did I bring that? I went to this um, auction in Geneva last week by, I don't know how to pronounce this, Enichen, Enichen. I went and I, I went to the preview. I looked at this Gerald Genta um, Turbion Sonnery repetition, which is amazing. Uh, it sold for a quarter of a million dollars. I went into the President Wilson Hotel to the preview and held it in my hand and looked at it. It was super cool. Um, this was made in like 2004, which is after the Gerald Genta brand was sold to, uh, what do you call it? Um, Bulgari or, or LVMH slash Bulgari, I believe. Um, but the, um, this watch is uh, very similar to, <laughs> to this watch. It's transparent in the front and transparent in the back and it's skeletonized. You can see the little Cote de Genève there. That's like the seal for Geneva. Um, you can see GG dial dots. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's kind of amazing. Um, but basically, I want to look at it because of the um, uh, the markings on it. I didn't know the date that it was made. I, I thought it might be earlier. So I went to look at the stamps and stuff on it, which I did. But they're, they're post-2000, so they have nothing to do with the GG. But um, it was cool to see it. And then I talked to this the, the, the guy from the auction house, Ricardo, about the GG a bit. And he, he said something that was great 
for me, which is um, I told him this, the whole story very briefly, like a two minute version. I should record that because it's like I can't say anything in two minutes, but under pressure to like just explain to him what was going on, I, I explained it very quickly and um, and he took it all in. And then he was like, you can't trust anybody in the in the vintage watch business. Like basically, he said, everybody's a liar. And uh, I've I've felt like bad making any accusation that anybody's lying just because I feel like it's not. First of all, there's a libel issue with that, um, but also it just sounds really negative. But 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 it, it was refreshing for me to hear him say that because let's let, if you back off of this GG watch for a second and think about other vintage watches, basically what he's saying is that provenance is where a lot of these people that are dealing vintage watches they make their mark up by knowing the the, the potential for pro, for for a very uh interesting watch to have an interesting provenance or you know to be of a greater value and they're the whole way that they make money is by buying something uh that the the seller doesn't know what they actually have and then they they turn it over and they sell it for much more so basically, that was what what I interpreted him as saying when I told him the story was like he was like, "Don't trust what anybody tells you about this watch, um, because that's the that's the game." And so, I still am trying to approach the whole documenting of it from the point of view of trying to stick with facts, getting into speculation where it's helpful because the facts themselves don't tell a story. Like you have to speculate a, a little bit about the the why. And then, um, and then just follow it as far as it goes, the, the story. So I, I've done quite a bit of work on the um, PDF, if you haven't seen it lately. And so there were these newspaper stories around uh, August of 1995 that, the, that, that mentioned this person who registered the crab mark and told a story, but they were written by a journalist who I reached out to, Marcus Baumgartner, who ended up becoming a corporate crisis management consultant for the past 20 years. At the time that he wrote those articles, he was a journalist. Um, and I'm not accusing him of doing this as, as corporate crisis management per se, but I am interested in his opinion on where the the boundary is between taking a press release from a company and making that into a story as a journalist and and crisis management. Because I think that there that's a spectrum of, um, you know, we, if you look at how journalism has been exercised over the past, uh, since the beginning of the printing press, there are incentives for people to, to publish certain things, to get certain messages out. And sometimes those messages may be, um, you know, uh, Hiding secrets <laughs> as opposed to being 100% truthful. Okay, so anyway, the the other thing I had mentioned is that in this book, there was a story of this Rado dial prototype. The Rado dial prototype was mentioned in um, Mr. Swatch by Jörg Weglin. I reached out to Jörg Weglin and asked him if he thought that they could be the same. And he said he went through the PDF very carefully and he didn't know, like he couldn't say if they were related, not the same, but if the two watches were related. So um, Jörg Weglin wasn't sure, but then I, do I dove into this database of Swiss newspapers in part to get the translations of the Bar Baumgartner articles or get readable versions and translate them. Um, so I got that. I know the I know kind of the story around the Zug court case and the registrant and the results of that and what was published in the newspaper. And then there was also the story of the Rado dial prototype, which um, Jörg Weglin either wouldn't, didn't want to reveal his source or didn't know, uh, couldn't confirm who that source was. But in the, um, when I started searching this uh, database called Swiss Docs, which is kind of funny, Swiss D-O-X, like doxing a person. When I started searching Swiss docs, but Swiss docs is not about doxing. It's actually the whole, it's the official or not. A, yeah. Anyway, it's a whole archive of Swiss uh, publications since the 1990s. Um, 
And searching that, I found another longish article by Stefan Bartmeller that was published in, um, what's it called? Uh, a news weekly news magazine called Facts in September of 1995, six weeks after the, the Baumgartner articles came out. And Stefan Bartmeller's Barmettler's uh, article addresses the swatch prototype with the Rado dial specifically, and the dates all kind of match. Not, not kind of, but like in the in the in the in Zug, the the guy, the registrant was supposedly arrested in December of 1991, and in in Bartmettler's, if you click on this link, you can also read the whole translation of this story. So this is what appeared in the 1995 in the weekly news magazine Facts, um, translated to English. So anyway, these stories align very closely in terms of dates, but they're very different. So it's like, I, I don't know what to think about that at this point. I, I put my kind of speculative opinion in here, but it still needs to be figured out. Now, there's another thing I want to show you here, which is super interesting. And I just got this today. Um, And that is so. This is the GG. And here, so what I the the, the registrant sent me really low res uh, photos taken with his iPhone six of these press articles from nineteen ninety five that he had apparently kept for 30 years, the paper version, and he photographed them and sent them to me after I spoke with him and he said that he had made this watch. And this is one of those articles. So what I did was I went back to the newspaper and I asked them to, uh, if they could pull it out of the archive and send me a, a, a better scan of it, which they did. I'm gonna have to block, block, block out his name. That's hard to do. Hmm, I should have done that beforehand. Uh, so maybe I'll cut to a different version of this. Yeah, you you can't see what's on my screen, but I can't. Anyway, I'll cut to a, a block, blacked out version. But what the basically I'm trying to not publish his name because he asked me not to. So the um, but what's interesting here is that the the dial in the newspaper in the in the good scan, you can see that it's a the it's a handmade dial just like the GG's, but it's different. So I'm convinced that it's a different watch. And in particular, these three gold indices are basically in a line here, or if anything, the middle one is slightly lower. And in the newspaper, the, the middle one is significantly higher. So and the other ones are kind of the same, but they're, I mean, they're not that different, but that, that nine o'clock indice set of three indices uh, is different enough based on my other videos and my, my own like researching how the, how the style was made. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the same construction, but it's a physically different dial. So that means that it's a physically different watch, which means that there are at least two of them. So that, that's, that's one thing, super interesting. And the other thing is, uh, these two watches that are photographed for the newspaper are, one is the Chrono Skipper, which was designed and made in 1989 and released in 91, early 1990, no, 1990, sorry. So it was already out for a year and a half before uh, the, the story of the GG and Zug started to take place. For example, the, the mark on this was registered in June of uh, 1991. This, the, the skipper was out in 1990. Um, but the point about this is that the, uh, um, I, I love these details. The, this picture from the newspaper, the gold watch was lit very uniquely it's it's got a red light down here and it's got a blue green light up here 
and those lights are catching in the in the um, reflections in the gold and on the crystal and you can see that there's a, a unique rainbow lighting on it which is also in aggregate white and there's probably a, a, a white ring light that you can see here uh, also at work but those colorful lights mean a lot and the uh, and the same colorful lights were used on the skipper so there's this whole rabbit hole to go down which is like who took these pictures and where because the um these picture these two pictures were taken with the same lighting setup which means almost guaranteed at the same time and the same place because it's unique it's not something that you'll find this kind of lighting anywhere but it but it it, it adds to the credibility of my theory that this was a, a publicity photo that was organized by swatch um in other words it went through their it went through their PR department or their corporate communications department and ended up in the hands of the journalists in along with a press release, which it doesn't mean that the story is not true, but it just does mean that the story was managed by Swatch. And then that means that that story could have certain characteristics that were intentional, as opposed to just a journalist going to the court and reading the court record and writing something or they could also have gotten the information from the registrant himself. But the the chance that the registrant would take these pictures and provide them to the to the journalist, um, it's possible that his lawyer could be like, you should do this because it'll you're being exonerated and therefore you should make sure that the press knows that you've been exonerated. Um, but again, it really it really ends up being a question of like where what was the source of the photos? Was it the registrant? Was it Swatch? And if not, how were they how were they taken? Why were they taken with these particular visual characteristics? But the cool thing is the watch is a different it's a different physical object if you just go on those three indices. And stuff like that, to me, it's just like amazing to tunnel back through history and to find these details and to keep following them until I get to the answer. And there are lots of other tracks that I'm following, too, that are just they're, until they lead somewhere um, specific, I, there's, there's not that much to say about it. Um, the other thing I did is I sent pamphlets like this, which are just printouts of the PDF, to Gerald Genta's son, Frederick, who's a, a, a official in the government of Monaco. I think he like, leads their digital transformation team or something. Um, that's the son of Gerald Genta. And I also sent it to Nick Hayek Jr., who's the CEO of Swatch Group. Um, and that was just in the last week and a half uh, because I want them to know that uh, I'm, I respect both of their fathers and that I'm, I'm, I want them to know what I'm doing. And I also just wanted to personally say if they, if they want to tell me anything or share anything with me about their knowledge of it, they're welcome to. Um, because I felt like if I if I left them out, like previously I've talked to Swatch and Omega heritage teams, um, but uh, I didn't reach out directly. I did reach out to the CEO of Omega and he'd set up the heritage team meetings, um, but the, I hadn't reached out to Nick Hayek himself. So that, I don't know if that will result in anything either, but the, that's the kind of the process is to keep building, keep keep going deeper and deeper into details and building uh, contacts and the problem of course is that if I'm right this is a huge secret and it's been kept for a long time and even if I'm wrong it appears that it's a huge secret for whatever reason so wrong meaning Gerald Genta versus some coincidence of, of naming or whatever but there's another thing I want to say about the like naming thing and the, and the GG which gets back to the when I first saw this watch, I looked at the pictures and I was like, that is a signature block like. The, the registrant told me that the reason that he engraved GG in this was because. It stands for Gelb gold, which is yellow gold in German. 
But the fact is, that's a signature block. That's like, if you think about art and how artists work, when you number something, a series of something, and you sign it, you sign it near the number, and, and that's a, to me, this was immediately a signature block. And the idea that somebody would, would type GG on it, engrave it with GG, when it says 18K there and 750 here, which are both, the, the, these are the significations for gold only. And I guess you could do 750 red gold, but it's just like people have eyes. You don't need to type, you don't need to engrave GG in this. Um, so I, that's why from the beginning, as far as I'm concerned, this was solved from the moment I saw it. And the whole thing is just trying to figure out why, why it's a secret, not, not um, what it is, but why. And at the same time, I admit, I could totally be wrong. It's just that like, at some time when you go down this whole rabbit hole and all these details and you start picking a part, like, okay, I have 50 different pieces of evidence and then somebody's like, their, their mind becomes really analytical and they go, well, oh, that one piece of evidence doesn't sound quite right to me. It's like, well, you also have to zoom out and look at the, the whole picture and look at the most basic common sense interpretation of what you're looking at. And that's, the, that's what I keep coming back to as I go further because any little individual point as you try to construct a detailed narrative of the provenance of something, uh, can become there, you know, everything's unknown and not everything, but a lot of things are unknown. So you have to speculate. And then somehow in my mind and in other people's mind, you end up with this giant binary at the, at the core of it, which is like, is it, or is it not? And it's like, yes, that binary is important, but there's also, uh, all the little skirmishes on the way there to, to exactly how that, how, the truth of that binary is is the composite for that. Um, none of them really matter. It's like in the end, it's the whole. You've got to piece together the whole story, and that's what's fascinating about it. All right, I think that's it. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, there's one other thing, which is like I I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep YouTubing as much. Not that anybody cares really, but the. Um, I just have other things I'm working on and uh, I'll, uh, I may not be posting as much, as much as I would like to. Okay, thanks for watching.